You're listening to After Images, a podcast for cinephiles that takes a deep dive into moving images. Each episode features a special guest who is invited to explore a film of their choice. After Images is hosted by film writers Franck Bouleg and Marisa C. Hayes. In today's episode of After Images, we'll be discussing the iconic American television series Buffy the Vampire Slayer in the company of Harley Payton. Buffy aired in 1997 and ran for seven seasons. The show's title character, Buffy Summers, played by Sarah Michelle Gellar, is the chosen one, a lone vampire slayer who lives in the ostensibly normal town of Sunnydale, California. But Sunnydale was built atop a hell mouth and acts as a beacon for vampires, demons, and other creatures of the night. Surrounded by her Scooby gang of friends who support her in everything from battling big bads to weathering the ups and downs of growing up, Buffy saves the town and her friends countless times. The success of Buffy the Vampire Slayer led to the creation of a spin-off, Angel, that ran from 1999 to 2004, as well as a whole collection of novels and comics. The series maintains a strong cult following today, celebrated for its trailblazing feminist and queer representation, its excellent writing, and genre-defying story arcs. We are joined today by Emmy-nominated American television producer, showrunner and writer Harley Payton, whose first screenplay for a feature film was Less Than Zero in 1987. While regularly working for various film productions over the years, he also contributed to many memorable TV series such as Twin Peaks, Channel Zero, Project Blue Book and Chucky. In 2021, he created Reginald the Vampire, a comedic horror television series based on the Fat Vampire books, which has recently been renewed for a second season. So we're really pleased to, de- to be here today on After Images with Harley Payton. Welcome to After Images. Um, when we invited Harley Payton to speak with us today, he suggested Buffy the Vampire Slayer, the television series, um, as his topic of discussion. And we are delighted because this is such a special show for Frank and myself as well. Um, so please, Harley, could you tell us why Buffy? What does Buffy mean to you? And also, what does Buffy mean to you as a writer? Well, I mean, it's interesting because it's unlike a lot of people. And I think about this a lot because every writer's room I'm in, Buffy tends to be a kind of totem for a lot of the writers there. And they, there's a kind of shorthand, a creative shorthand or references that everyone talks about. But almost every one of those writers saw it maybe when they were in high school in 2010. and others, they saw it later. My joke was always if someone came to me and said, yeah, you know, I discovered this band, the Beatles, yesterday, and I think they're really awesome. And my, and my reply would be, but it's not the same thing as when your first album is Meet the Beatles. And the first record I ever bought was Meet the Beatles. So it's, you know, it's, it's just a different thing. And so for me, I was there at the time. And I got to be honest, I didn't watch it when it was first on. I thought it was like the movie was sort of not so good. I'd heard that. And it felt like it was maybe a, a show for kids, although I mean, you know, I was in my 40s, maybe then. Um, And then there was an article in the New York Times that said, this is my guilty pleasure, not a term I'm overly fond of, but nonetheless, this show is wonderful and everyone should be watching it. And so I decided, okay, well, I have to watch Buffy. And right when I decided to watch it, the season three finale was postponed because of the mass shooting at Columbine, right? Back when shootings in America weren't happening on a daily basis, God help us. But that because it was such a big and strange thing. So I didn't see it until that summer, if I recall, right? And I'm watching these characters who I have know nothing about the mayor and graduation and you know, Angel, who's this guy, Angel, who's apparently leaving, right? And I was just hooked from the first moment I saw it. So the rest of that summer, I watched the first two seasons, right? Watched episodes every day till I could catch up. And then I was quite frankly that fall ready for Buffy season four and Angel season one that fall. And I was totally completely hooked and and i it's i there are certain shows that just take hold of you and and it's sometimes hard to understand why exactly but that show certainly did and i think it was about the writing it was about the performances they had such a wonderful cast 
And it was a show that I just fell in love with. And to this day, I continue to watch it. I mean, it's because it, it becomes, it's it's totemic for me as well. And and particularly with the things that I tend to write. I mean, I'm doing a show at the moment called Reginald the Vampire, which is a sort of rom-com workplace comedy vampire show. But there's so much of, so much Buffy in its DNA because the Buffy's, in, it's in my DNA. It's funny, there's a television channel called Fuse where I live. And I would never have noticed it before. It's the strangest channel in the world. The only way to describe Fuse is that it's a queer hip hop Buffy channel. And so there's all this really amazing stuff on it, but they probably run, I would say five hours, maybe even 10 of Buffy a day, right? And so at home, my wife was always, oh, Buffy on the TV again. I mean, I sometimes I just keep it running. And then every once in a while, I want to stop just to watch a particular episode. Like, oh, it's I Only Have Eyes for You, which is one of my favorite episodes. I mean, whatever it is, I'll, I'll dig in there. But I don't know. I think as a writer, I just I feel like the ability to write things that to write comedy, but also to be kind of really deeply moving and melodramatic, that mix of tones felt new to me then. And and so it was really, really inspirational. And bear in mind, this is not long after Twin Peaks, which was another experience for me where comedy, melodrama were all being kind of mixed together. And while this was a completely different show, actually, it's funny, Joss Whedon was once interviewed and he, and he said that there were two writers rooms he wished he'd been in. And those were The Simpsons and Twin Peaks. Um, oddly enough, my wife for my birthday, tried to get me lunch with Joss Whedon. It never happened. <laughs> um, because we, it's a ridiculous Hollywood story. We had the same masseuse. But anyway, but see, he's someone who I admire so much. And Angel, I was a huge fan of Angel as well. I think that's a wonderful television show. Mm-hmm. And of course, the crossovers. So, you know, but but for me, it's just, it it, it, it spoke to me in a way that I, I instantaneously became sort of part of what I wanted to do. And, and I'm sure it's had a big impact on the way that I write. Mm-hmm. It, it definitely feels like a whole universe. And do you think that perhaps the fact that you started watching it uh, with the third season might have helped this um, uh, feeling of liking it so much because you had so much to catch up with? And uh, um... yeah, that's, a, that's a very interesting point. Yeah, I think so. Because then going back, I would go, oh, OK, there's Angel. OK, now I see what's happening here. And and the first season is like the first season of a lot of shows. It's like finding its feet and there's really amazing episodes and then there's less amazing episodes. But it but it's having seen three and knowing where it was going was sort of an interesting frame for me. And then, of course, season two, which I go back and forth all the time. But there are times when I would say it was my favorite season. I mean, because it's just I always thought that that Buffy had this very simple thesis, which was monster of the week, love story, big bad, right? Mm -hmm. Those three things had to be addressed in any season or episode Mm -hmm. and season two, they were all the same thing, Mm -hmm. right? It was Angelus and it was the love story and he was the big bad. And, you know, those, the ending of those of that season um, becoming, I think it's called, but it, it just, you know, it's amazing to me. So, yeah, but I think watching it sort of in a weird way, slightly backwards, um, <laughs> probably did impact, you know, the way that it came to me and what I thought about it. I think it's probably true. Hmm. Yeah. I was wondering if we could go back to something you mentioned about those kind of genre crossovers that we find yeah. in Buffy and Twin Peaks that I think were just so iconic in the television landscape of the 1990s. Can you maybe speak a little bit more about that? and maybe help situate us in terms of what the kind of general concept was in the 90s, um, or not concept, I mean to say more barriers that one might face with this kind of genre-defying use of noir that we find in Twin Peaks, but also comedy, soap opera, and then there are the B-grade sci-fi references. I mean, and you know, I've never really... And it's funny because there are, there are episodes whenever Whedon would do a kind of a dream episode or there'd be weird fantasies. It always felt very Twin Peaks to me. Mm-hmm. So I'm, I'm given his previous statements. I'm sure that it was an inspiration for him. But that was really my first uh, dealing with that. Right. Because I was a development writer writing movies. Most of them don't get made. Some of them do. But, you know, you did a comedy, you did a comedy. You were doing a drama or a melodrama. You were doing a melodrama. And then, of course, I met Mark Frost. And suddenly we're engaged in this crazy world where kind of everything is possible, right? That you could you could do a scene that would touch your heart in such a deep and, and, and felt way. And yet you could also do something completely absurd and comedic, right? And, and so for me, that was sort of my training in that world. 
And and when I went to Buffy, it was like, oh, and this is, I just didn't know this because as I said, I didn't watch the first seasons. But when I started watching, I went, oh, here it is again, mm -hmm. right? Here's another show, I mean, that can really touch me and yet at the same time, it can be really funny. It can be absurd, right? I mean, it's 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 so much fun that way. There's an executive at, at Universal who, when we're on our notes meetings, we often talk about Buffy, right? So again, it's a touchstone. And I'll say, well, <clears throat> and it's also a good excuse for me to get them to approve something because if I compare it to Buffy, they'll go, oh, of course, of course, of course, right? But she confessed a month ago that ah, she's never really seen it. Mm -hmm. So she's now doing a kind of, you know, all season catch up. Um, she got COVID, so she's just been staying home and watching. But she texted me yesterday with a kind of sobbing emoji saying, oh, I just saw the body and I knew it was coming and it still killed me. And that's the thing about Buffy. I mean, that first summer when I was going through the season, it's funny, I would watch an episode, you know, on VCR, right? And I'm watching the tape and I would frequently do it on a treadmill. Like I'd get on a treadmill for an hour and I'm surprised I didn't fall and break my leg because I'm like sobbing on the treadmill <laughs> while I'm watching the end of I only have eyes for you and just going you know that so that that to me is it's it's just it's the way i love to write and i think mark taught me so much about that when we were doing peaks and then i i think i i've learned a lot also just from watching buffy i mean and watching those the way he could do those transitions from something quite serious to something less so right and and even in the later seasons which get more dramatic same thing and and for me really really an inspiration but this syncretic nature of the storytelling is highly reminiscent of life itself, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely. The thing about Buffy that I, and I've said this many times, it, it's the best show about high school I've ever seen. And and set aside vampires, you know, set aside werewolves. It's just about high school. And, and they were so good at taking high school tropes and then using them as metaphors and building out into the world the, the narratives that they wanted to tell. So there were cheerleader episodes and there was the swim team and there was the evil principal. And I mean, all the things that they did, they were so, so good about that. The girl who feels invisible and in fact is invisible, right? It's, it's, uh, that was one of the things that I think they did best was taking the high school experience. I mean, as I said before, you know, you look at Buffy's sort of arc through this world and, and she meets a boy she falls for and they get together and they finally make love for the first time. And it turns out he's a monster. Well, in this case, actual monster, mm -hmm. right? And to me, that was the way Whedon was able to navigate those things. And, and that's why I think for a lot of fans, it, it was tougher when you're suddenly in college, because you had to start that all, you had to kind of reset yourself in a way. And yet the first episodes they did there were about having a bad roommate, you know, and it turns out your roommate's a demon, right? right? Again, I just, to me, that was so smart and, and something that actually doing a vampire show now do, have done sort of the same thing, right. that it's use those metaphors, take those tropes and find the real world basis for them and what the connection can be between the two. Yeah, and you were mentioning the the links that one can find between Twin Peaks and Buffy, and both shows are situated above some sort of hell mouth. Yeah. Um, and there is the owl cave in Twin Peaks, and there is the hell mouth in, in Sunnydale. And in both shows, um, you have demons which are there to represent the evils of the world that uh, surround us. So yes. um, I, I think that, th that that's another layer that um, somehow under underlines what you just said. Yeah, I think it's almost something you take in unconsciously. I mean, I think, and, and I'm sure I know almost... Because I, you know, I talk to Twin Peaks fans a lot because they reach out to me, and and Buffy is something that they all love too, for obvious reasons, I suspect. In other words, it's there's there's a handful of shows that that create worlds in a way that are that are so dynamic and so memorable, and that you feel both completely a part of, but also feel strange and wonderfully foreign, right? Mm -hmm. And that to me, that's Twin Peaks. That that's the start of that. So with Buffy, it was like that too, and it was the way. Friends come together and the way friends fall apart. I mean, I just thought that that was another thing that that he did so brilliantly. And those actors were all pretty young at the time, too. So it wasn't it wasn't like they had 28 year olds playing 18 year olds. Right. And so they were also kind of and, and I know 
it's funny, and I know nothing about the process of production for Buffy, but I know what it was like on Peaks for the very young actors to kind of, who were finding themselves as human beings and also finding themselves as actors, right? And I watched that process on a daily basis. And I can't imagine what it must have been like for, you know, Sarah Michelle Gellar or um, you know, Hannigan or any of these people to kind of be going through this world or James Marsters, um, you know, even for someone like that, I mean, what an experience that must have been, you know, it's, uh, it's, it's pretty thrilling. Um, yeah. <laughs> Are there any particular story arcs that you love to come back to? I know you mentioned that season two is a special favorite. Yeah, it, you know, it depends. There are certain, there are certain things I loved about the show. That arc, of course, season two is 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 one of the most extraordinary ones. I think season five is too, because I mean, I I always to me the seasons always tilt a lot based on who the big bad is, right? And for me, Glory and the Mayor were my two favorites, right? I mean, they're just wonderful, right? And such wonderful performers. And interestingly enough, in both cases, comedic characters, right? Glory was very funny, right? The Mayor was very funny. Adam, season four, not so funny. And so I think that the show is sort of on its legs in the best possible way when you had big bads who could kind of bring that sense of humor. But that whole arc in season five with Dawn and, and you know, Buffy understanding her gift and that her gift is death and what does that mean? I mean, that was beautifully put together. And, and of course, Wheaton is also the king of, I mean, it's not really an Easter egg, but it's like, you know, Dawn out of nowhere, yes, but, but also hints of it coming. I mean, it's so brilliant that he clearly... I mean, because there's so many shows where you're just kind of throwing it at the wall and making it up as you go. And and I'm I'm sure there was a part of that for him. But it's obvious that he also planned long term in a way that to me is pretty stunning. I mean, Don's the most famous example of that. But but yeah, I think season five for me was was something that I loved a lot. I also really loved her relationship with Faith. So you get a lot of that in season three. I mean, she was so wonderful. And that's the other thing about this show is that they kept bringing in characters who just made the show better. Right. Mm -hmm. And I may not have been a fan of Kendra the Vampire Slayer, but but I will say that, you know, obviously Spike and Drusilla and the world just kept getting bigger. And, and to me, it was that. And I and so you are constantly kind of taking that in and experiencing it and then wondering how much bigger will it get. Right. Mm -hmm. Until, of course, Sunnydale just collapses on itself and it's just a big hole in the ground. Mm -hmm. um, but again, to, for me, it's, yeah, so it's it was arcs, and it's also just moments. When I think about Buffy, I think about moments. I think about that little umbrella at the prom that they gave, that they give her, you know, that Jonathan gives her, and just how beautiful that was. And that whole sequence was so lovely. Um, and then, of course, that actor, who's now become, of course, a wildly successful feature writer, which I think is wonderful. But he his, his arc through the series, right? You know, going from being the picked on kid at school, and then the kid, and then there's that wonderful episode where he's like, John and superstar and everyone thinks he's the most amazing person who's ever lived this is one of my favorite episodes and then he's a member of the three right those three nerdy villains if you will and it's it, watching even those arcs to me i found fascinating and and by the way we not being afraid to kind of delve into complicated issues right i mean and setting aside the fact that we've all now heard the stories uh, you know that he's a complicated man and, and there's no question about that we know that um but, but but the way he approached those things in series, which is my only knowledge of him, I thought was just wonderful. And whether it's something like, and, and it was very cognizant of the way toxic masculinity um, impacts women, right? I mean, that was something that he did. I mean, that, I remember there was the one boyfriend who was taking some substance that was making him an angry demon, but it was really about being in an abusive relationship with his girlfriend, right? And then of course, the scene that a lot of people hate when Spike really comes very close to raping her, right, in that bathroom, right? And so I, I I do appreciate that he didn't shy away from those things, right? In other words, you're making this television show and everyone loves all these characters and it's so easy to just kind of coast on that, right? But he wasn't afraid to show that good people can do bad things or complicated people can. And then what's important is what happens in the aftermath, right? And, and, and how they attend to that. Yeah. Um, I really appreciated that. And it's so good to hear you say that, too, because I'm reminded, you know, as many people get, um, well, very opinionated about whether or not it's okay to appreciate this show or what we might think of Joss Whedon. But I think it's also recognizing this complexity and also the fact that it is a collaborative art form and that it's there on the screen and that many people went into that 
process um, yeah. and that we're not going to erase all of the wonderful work that so many of those people have done. And I'm, agree. oh, sorry. <laughs> no, I couldn't agree more. I, I have to tell you, I mean, for me, it's, it's, it is, it is art and I appreciate, and I don't have to, I can, I can have complicated feelings about the artist, but what I'm taking in is the art whether I'm looking at a painting or I'm watching a movie or I'm watching a television show. And, and there's no more collaborative art than television because mm -hmm. the movies can be more directed by the director, right? But in television, there's so many different parts to it. And yes, there are showrunners who have a big impact on the work that they do, but you're absolutely right about the collaboration. And, and even for, and look, some of the actors were unhappy at the time, we're all aware of those stories, but when you see them on screen, they're doing amazing work. And, and I think that's the that's the thing I honor first and foremost. And look, I know some people can't do that, but I've been able to kind of separate that out in a way because I have no problems watching Buffy because it's such a wonderful show. And I think also, I mean, one of the things it did, I was going through episodes, you know, kind of preparing for this. And I just forgot Marty Knoxon and Jane Espenson and Drew Z. Greenberg and all these writers um, who just did amazing work, right? And went on to do great work, right? In other words, Marty Knox in particular, but also Espenson and, and of course, Drew Z. Greenberg. So, you know, it's uh, to me, it was, uh, it's, I mean, Twin Peaks was a much shorter process, obviously, but there was a little bit of that, right? There was like this big, weird family who were creating something special. And, and actually, I knew some of the people I had done a pilot um, for a series. It was called Moon Over Miami. It was on ABC for like an hour, for like, you know, half a season, right? We did our best. We failed. Um, but the but what's funny about it is that the DP was a man named Michael Gershman, right? And so, and so who then was eventually the DP on Buffy and then actually directed some episodes. Hmm. And also the producer whose name, it's so awful that I'm not remembering it. Because the producer who, who worked on my show, Moon Over Mammy, was this, um, was it Gavin? This wonderful British man and so sweet and, and older than me and kind of very kind of nice about my failures and was very kind of kind and is a perfect kind of person you want in the room with you. And his next job was Buffy. So it was so nice to see some of that family that I was well familiar with uh, sort of moving on and, and being part of something which was so special to me. Mm. And also, whatever happened later with Joss Whedon, I think there is no denying the fact that the show had a huge impact on the collective psyche, that it yeah. really touched a lot of people and changed the way we think uh, about yeah. the relationships between uh, male and female, between uh, um, gay people. I mean, it really yes. took a, a wide variety of themes and really moved things forward for all of us. No, it's extraordinary if you really, because you're just having so much fun watching it, you don't think about that. But if you think about it, it's yes. And everyone talks about the girl power aspect, which is extraordinarily important, right? And has been so influential, but also there's the queer aspect, right? And those and those were things that just weren't being done then, right? And so I think that that show really did, was a safe space for a lot of people. Um, and that's why I know a lot of gay women who love the show, right? For obvious reasons, right? It's, it's totemic for them for all sorts of reasons, but it's also about feeling seen, right? And I think Whedon was really wonderful at, at, at help, helping people be seen, right? People of all different varieties. And then digging into the complexity of those people. I mean, what more complex relationship can there be than Buffy and Spike? And yet, certainly for me, because everyone argues about, you know, is it about Buffy and Spike or Buffy and Angel? But for me, Buffy and Angel was a far more traditional romantic arc, which I completely fell for. But Buffy and Spike felt real to me. And that's ridiculous when you're talking about a vampire slayer and a vampire. But the fact <laughs> of the matter is, it felt real to me and everything it went through and him wanting, him going off to kind of survive these tests to get a soul and what that cost him. I, I just, that was all really fascinating to me. And, 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 but you are right about the impact I think that the show's had. I don't think there's, I think that's unquestionable. And, and by the way, you know, Angel, again, a show that I loved a great deal, right? I mean, all the work he did after that, um, I was really Dollhouse, um, Firefly, I was there for every one of those shows. And by the way, I was a pretty big fan of The Nevers, which I really thought was a very interesting show. And, you know, one of the unfortunate byproducts of everything that happened is that he then left. And then the show, you know, then the, the current Warner Brothers apocalypse, they just dumped it, right? So mm -hmm. there's episodes out there unseen that a different showrunner was handling. But, but even then, I think you see all the hallmarks of how he approaches story 
and mm -hmm. how he approaches character. Mm -hmm. And and again, that ability to mix humor and pathos and, and, mm -hmm. and action sequences. I remember an actor friend of mine who was watching Angel based on my reputation, my re recommendation, was saying, man, those fight scenes are really well done, right? And this is someone who's been in a lot of movies with a lot of fight scenes. And mm -hmm. he thought it's just, it's it, that's what impressed him all of a sudden. Mm -hmm. and that's something you might even think about, right? A bit, but it's true about the show. Yeah. Oh, sorry, but talking about the action scenes and the, the girl power, I was uh, thinking about the, the link once again with Twin Peaks and um, the, the, the yeah. character of Flora Palmer and um, of oh. the, um, um, Laura, um, fights in her own way, um, uh, all the evil that is around her. Um, but sometimes I wonder if um, uh, she wouldn't have met a different ending if she had learned some Kung Fu. <laughs> yeah, it would have helped. Although Mark <laughs> tried to give her a different ending in season three. Um, but it's, yeah, that's funny. It's like, ima yeah, imagine if, if you know, if Buffy had started with a close-up of her headstone. Right. And it's like, oh, she's dead. And now we're going to learn her story. Right. I yeah. mean, yeah, I think that's absolutely true. And it and it, it but and again, what I thought was so wonderful about it is that you have that girl power aspect. And yet with Willow and particularly Dark Willow um, in, you know, when she basically is going to destroy the world in season, I think it's four, that you get a whole different aspect of it. And, and that the metaphor is really drug addiction. But but nonetheless, it's about power and the uses of it and and what's important about that and and how kindness is a kind of power as well and, and i always loved xander you know yeah you, you frequently have television shows where there's always the one character who has no superpowers they have no mm -hmm. nothing and what are they going to do and i always thought xander's path um i thought it was pretty interesting and, and i thought the way he became who he became by the end lacking one eye um was was sort of wonderful and i know i used to listen to a podcast here um that actually two two gay women did who were very huge buffy fans and boy do they hate xander i'm telling you <laughs> i'd be listening i'd be listening to the podcast and he is sort of an asshole early on because he <laughs> loves buffy by the way but but also his toxic masculinity if you want to call it that was very purposeful it wasn't like we'd made a mistake that's what he wanted to locate in xander at that time and and of course needless to say these women didn't care that charisma carpenter was every bit as mean because you know cordelia was cordelia but i mean i just and, and that's another aspect of it it's like there's characters in this show that by themselves would be worth a show or an hour podcast right i mean think about cordelia and all the things she went through and and also just the way you play out her world and the kind of the rich girl who then loses everything and and you know i think maybe my favorite i mean it's, and xander buying her dress for the prom i mean those little touches like that kill me amends i think might be my favorite episode and when that magical snowfall happens at the end in sunnydale there's just something i think truly lovely about that and, and again that was season three and so that would have been me sobbing on my treadmill as i'm watching <laughs> as i'm working my way through the season but it's um it's a rare show that can make you laugh and can make you happy and that can inspire you and can make you cry, right? And, and I know that for me, that's something that that's important to me as I've moved forward in the work I've done. And that's just a, that multiplicity of emotion, I think is so important. Yeah, yeah. And I, I'm wondering, as someone who was working in television in the 90s, do you have any thoughts about the WB, the role of the WB, or perhaps any memories? Um, I know that a lot of people initially thought they were kind of a joke, and I'm just curious yeah. what your take on, on them was. No, I mean, I think it's, I mean, Buffy obviously is the, is, is the show that sort of made them in a way, and and it and it also forced people to kind of take a look at, at different approaches to television. And, it's, and it wasn't just, as this New York Times article pointed out, it's not just a show for kids, right? It's about young people, but it's, but it's not a show just for them because of the universality of so many of the themes. And I think the WB and then later the CW, I mean, I was a big CW fan. I would, there were so many of those shows that I would watch because a lot of them were cousins to Buffy, right? They weren't accomplishing the same thing and they weren't breaking new ground in that way, but they were, but every one of those shows was inspired by Buffy, I think, because it, just tonally, because there would be the melodrama, there would be the humor and the better ones, Flash, or some of those, like those kind of shows really did, I think, take that to heart as I think so many writers have. I mean, you hear writers talk all the time about like Lindelof and other people about how much Twin Peaks inspired them. And that's always been real gratifying. And, and I think Buffy is probably another one, not too much later in the nineties that had a huge impact on writers and, and moving forward. And I, it's not cited enough. And I, I feel like it should be. It's one of the reasons why I want to talk about it um, because I think it has been so inspirational. Mm -hmm. 
And have you seen the film, Buffy? You know what? It's funny. It's back, you know, now that it's all streaming, but back in the days, we'd just be like flicking through channels. Every once in a while, I would see it on and I would watch it. And it's like, it, it just it was like, this is the wrong timeline. It's the wrong universe. I can't do this. <laughs> right? It was like, and, and that has nothing to do with quality of the movie. I, I couldn't even tell you what the quality is. Hmm. But it, but it, but for me, it just felt, it just felt wrong. It was almost like when they announced at Fox that they were going to do a Buffy reboot, hmm. which I thought was a terrible idea. Hmm. And it never happened. So maybe they figured out that it wasn't a great idea. I mean, hmm. for me, what was amazing, and this is a whole other world that I spend a lot of time in, but I've been reading Buffy comic books now for 10 mm -hmm. years, maybe longer than Angel, too. I mean, I remember Angel ending so abruptly with the four of them walking in to fight that last fight. You know, I always wanted to kill a dragon, I think somebody says. And, and, and the Angel comic books actually picked up like the next season. Right. Mm -hmm. That was Angel season five. And mm -hmm. Buffy's got a little bit of that, too. And there's there's a couple and there's now they're getting into different versions of Buffy. Mm -hmm. So the one I'm reading now, you know, Buffy doesn't even know she's a vampire slayer because they're not telling her. And it's it's, in fact, Willow, who's the vampire slayer. And mm -hmm. there's another one that's really tremendous where it's Buffy in middle age. Right. And what is that like? And what is it? She's not a slayer anymore. And so and I've loved the fact that and we have had something to do with a lot of that, obviously, the comic books. And so for me, that it was it was funny that shows you love end and you don't want them to end. I certainly didn't want Buffy to end even after seven seasons. But it's it's nice that the comic books are another way to sort of engage with those characters and sort of see what the possibilities are because the possibilities quite frankly are endless i mean and the one i'm reading now you know xander is taking care of a huge crab baby which is you know they just do <laughs> they, they continue to have that sense of humor and there's a subversiveness to what they do as well which i think is really important um and again that weeding thing about amy the rat it's like oh my god <laughs> right i mean she's a rat and now she and then suddenly she she comes back in one episode for a blink mm -hmm. and then she's gone again and she's back to being a rat i mean just i don't know I, I there's it's it's rare that there's an episode on that i can't go there's something in this for me that i can watch again and even learn from mm -hmm. yeah. yeah and it's interesting what you mentioned about the comics because we were going to ask you what you thought about the comics we're big fans of the comics as well okay and it's, okay it's so interesting to see how certain series have really continued in this form of sequential art and it works surprisingly well I, I personally wasn't much of a comic reader before I started reading the Buffy comics and now I've, I've also read the X-Files comics which I think are pretty well done oh, too wow. yeah oh, that's awesome. yeah it's funny I was I was a comic book reader when I was a you know tiny 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 kid and then I walked away from it and, cause I'm, and I'm a huge reader of novels. So I'm always reading, you know, whatever. And there was, I was up for a job in the early aughts to, for an early version of the movie Shazam, right? Not the one that was made later. And, and so I had to read comics to kind of, you know, so I'm going to Golden Apple, a famous comic store in Los Angeles. And I started reading, you know, Shazam. And then I went, wait a minute, there's a Buffy comic. <laughs> and so I just fell down that rabbit hole. Mm -hmm. I mean, and for me, I'm a huge comic book reader now. And and you're right. And there's comics devoted to Spike and ones to Angel and the ones that just picked up where it left off. But also there's different takes on those worlds and, and different ways of approaching the characters that I really appreciate. I mean, there's that hilarious, I don't know which book it is, but it's the one where Angel is actually starring in a TV show about himself mm -hmm. and Cordelia is in it and it's not going well, quite frankly. But I just, I yeah, I love the comic books and it's I can't think of many TV shows. Well, now you're mentioning X-Files, so I should look at it because that's definitely a favorite TV show of mine. Um, in fact, it's funny that the show I mentioned that I did at ABC briefly, I was at sort of a party that summer and David Duchovny was an acquaintance, not a friend, but an acquaintance. And I said, oh, what are you doing? He goes, oh, I'm going to Vancouver to make a show. And I, said, <laughs> and, I, and I said, oh, I'm going to South Beach to make a show. And he said, well, you're lucky. You're going to Miami. I'm going to make this. I don't know what to think. Well, and of course, that show turns out to be one of my favorite shows. And by the way, x Files is another one. I mean, it's another show, not unlike Buffy, where I can dip in at any time. Right. And of course, it was much more dedicated to Monster of the Week stuff. But but I love that show. And by the way, another show that was a springboard for so many wonderful writers. Mm -hmm. Man, Vince Gilligan, mm -hmm. first and foremost. But I mean, that's it's interesting how those shows 
you know, those are choices that are made. You know, Chris Conte, he's choosing those writers and Whedon is bringing in those writers and bringing in so many female voices that, you know, that at the time, those weren't easy gigs to get. And, and it was, you know, Hollywood is, it's the 90s. It's still this kind of absurd white man's world, right? Mm -hmm. and, and women had to really fight for what they wanted to get. And so again, the thing about complicated Whedon is that he, is cre he created a space for all of those writers. And the one thing I've never heard is a writer feeling abused on that show, right? You've never heard of the writers complaining about that work environment. And, and I'm not surprised because what a great place, uh, again, like I had a briefly on Twin Peaks, but what a great place to sort of learn and, and, and write the things that you want to write. Yeah, mm. indeed. Yeah. I thought it was interesting what you mentioned about uh, being happy that uh, Buffy uh, didn't get a reboot because uh, there is actually a, a comic book series uh, which rebooted um, uh, Buffy. I don't know if you had the opportunity to read that, but I thought that was interesting uh, in a sense to see how um, the characters could relate to an audience from the 2020s uh, and uh, with the techno technological jump with uh, oh. um, uh, with the internet, with cell phones right. and all right. the technology that was then there in the 1990s. But without changing the actors who yeah. initially uh, interpreted those roles. Mm. So oh, they were really? the same. Yeah. Mm. Well, that's interesting. Yeah, I, I, there, I don't think there's any Buffy books I haven't read. I mean, because I'm mm. like, that's what I'd spend, you know, Wednesday's new comic book day. And I'm always ready for that. And so, yeah, I've, I really enjoy those. And I do like the art that honors who the original performers are. Right. I mean, I think that's, that's a big part of it for me. And there's certain artists who I think do amazing work. There's some who are, it's a little less so for me, whatever. But I mean, I just think being able to continue to experience that world, I just feel lucky, you know, because it would, because when Buffy went off the air and then Angel did, did they go off the air at the same time? I don't remember, but it, but it's, well, no, season three, Three, so season four, one year later, Angel went off the air. And that to me, that those were big losses in my television viewing because I watch a lot of television. And and it's and and it's been great to kind of follow those people along the way um, and see the, the other work they've done. It's funny, I met, I spent a night at an absurd party with Boreanaz once, who is truly like a human being if he was a Labrador retriever. <laughs> he is like the most kind of fun, enthusiastic puppy like not puppy but just this big it's pretty hilarious and actually i was lucky enough to work with uh marsters on a pilot that i wrote mm. and, and so that and that's to me it's like yeah give me more of that i want to work with all those people right it's mm. like that would be great that, because it just you know and i'm sure for them it can be a blessing and a curse but they do bring with them as any twin peaks actor world right they bring with a certain iconic stature that's yes it's about their work but it's also about the world that they are lucky enough to inhabit and that, to me, luck plays a huge part in that, mm -hmm. right? I mean, you just never know. It's about the Scooby gang, isn't it? I mean, they are really a family that you um, come visit and uh, spend time with. Yeah. Mm -hmm. No, absolutely. And I know it's funny because, and I think actually like Twin Peaks, there's been a kind of afterlife for a lot of the actors. They have conventions and, they, and sometimes they'll get them all together. Um, Marsters is funny because wherever he goes, and even when he did the pilot with me, he he sets up gigs for his rock and roll band because he loves that band, right? And I remember once walking back to set and he comes out of his trailer and says, oh, oh, listen, I just wrote a song. And I went, okay. And so I'm standing on the sidewalk and James frickin' Marsh Marsters is sitting in the steps to his trailer. He's playing me this beautiful love song. I have no idea how to react. I mean, I'm just, <laughs> this is amazing, but it's so weird. Um, but yeah, they all do that. It's funny. I went to Comic-Con for this show I'm working on last summer and we were in this moderately sized you know, hall. It was very nice and everyone was great. And the question was sort of interesting. And we're all feeling very full of ourselves, except of course, on my name card, they misspelled my name, which I kept, right? And so that I, Harley Pet Yop. And so I still <laughs> have that to this day. But so we leave that and I'm walking down the hall and there's a door to my right and I hear cheering the likes of I've not heard of the entire Comic-Con. And so I open the door because it's a door into the back of the hall, sort of like up, up in these, in the balcony. And there's Sarah Michelle Gellar, you know, announcing her return to genre and, mm -hmm. and in this world of, of werewolves, I guess. Right. So, mm -hmm. and that's something that she, you know, hadn't done. And I mean, people were losing their minds. Right. And, and that's because of Buffy. I mean, I can't even imagine what it must've been like for her mm -hmm. to play a character who's that iconic. Mm -hmm. Right. I mean, that's, I, I just can't imagine. Mm -hmm. 
And the twist is now she's the werewolf. <laughs> oh, <laughs> not, that. not a spoiler. Yeah. <laughs> no, not a spoiler. Exactly. It's like it's so funny. If that's, I mean, that's the. I mean, look, this is this is an art. It's a business. It's a lifestyle in a way. This world that we all work in, and and, and just to see how people navigate it, I, I always find fascinating. And and that's part of the work they're doing on the screen where you watch them. And it's part of what happens next. And there are wonderful stories and there are sad stories. I mean, there's every aspect of it, right? But it's the nice thing is you can go back, you can read some ridiculous news item about Xander, right? Or, oh, he was in a bar in North Carolina or whatever bullshit it is, right? But the really wonderful thing is you can also go back and watch the Love Potion episode where every woman at Sunnydale High is crazy about Xander, mm. right? Or, you know, or, or there's just those moments. It's like there's a moment where, and again, this is sort of Joss Whedon giving us a little hint where Buffy and Spike think they're getting married um, mm. because they're under that willow spell, right? It's like, you know, once again, it's it, it's, I've had so much fun and continue to, again, with this crazy TV channel, I'm all, I'll go, okay, I'm going to watch some of this because, and there aren't, there aren't a lot of shows that I've done that with. Um, and there are some that I intend to, but there's always so much new things to watch that it, it's, it's hard for me to go back. Like I'm determined to go back and watch lost because it was a show that I deeply loved at the time. Um, it, it has one of my favorite episodes of all time. Um, so there's a lot of great work there, but it's, you know, it's it's we all have there's a lot for us to watch for those of us who enjoy watching and, and what is currently the your favorite show um that uh, is currently running uh, that's a very good question um it's well like everyone I, I i i adore succession although it's a hard show to love in a way in other words because it's just it's so complicated and so thorny in its way and so brilliantly done right and it's and so, but it's certainly a show that I love and I'll be watching tonight. At the same time, Barry is one of those shows which has comedy, unbelievable action sequences now that actually he's directing. Mm -hmm. And, but also melodrama in a way that that tonally is probably closer to what I enjoy. And so it's something like that is, is, is a show that I just won't miss. It's funny, I watched a show on Roku. I didn't know what Roku was. I mean, I knew what it was called Slip. And it's by Lo Zoe Lister-Jones, who wrote and directed everything. And, and she was a very funny recurring character on the show, New Girl, which is an American show that I love that my daughter watches to self-soothe. So there's a lot of watching of New Girl in our house. And she was just the mayor on that show for like one season. And she's done this amazing show about a woman's journey through alternate realities of her life, right? Seven episodes. And and the gag is, or the the... It's it, you learn more about it later, but what she learned, she's in a without giving anything away, she's in a very sad dead end marriage. Um, and what happens is every time she orgasms, she finds herself in a new reality. So <laughs> that is that's a pretty bold concept. Hmm. And again, Zoe Lister Jones wrote and directed every episode, so I would put Slip right up there. I actually just finished it last night, um, so it's front of mind. But you know, I love Perry Mason just for the way they address the tropes of LA and the period aspects of it. I find that to be just a lot of fun, generally speaking. Mm -hmm. um, but I'm always on the lookout. I mean, I have to wait. I'm gonna step away just for one second. Hang on. <laughs> This is my list of shows. Oh, okay. wow. <laughs> this is how many shows that I've I've collected. And it's like The Consultant, haven't seen it yet. Mm -hmm. Lucky Hank, haven't seen it yet. Pachinko, I've heard it's wonderful, right? It's like there are so many shows out there. You know, you just have to find the time. And particularly now that I'm in production, I have very little time. Mm -hmm. uh, but it's but there's always it's always nice at night to like, you know, pour yourself a glass of wine and try to watch something. But I'm very likely to go, I think I'll watch an angel episode. That seems like the best way to go for me. Mm -hmm. um, I'm just thinking about what you mentioned about appreciating the X Files, and I wanted to mention that Frank and I were huge fans of Project Blue Book, and we were really, really oh. sad when the show was canceled. Um, oh, thank you. Yeah, that was I loved working on that show. It was uh, David David O'Leary, who who kind of you know it's it's sometimes writers in LA kind of win the lottery. In other words, David was a struggling writer. He was actually I think teaching at a, at a small school. Uh, teaching screenwriting but you know he whatever things weren't happening right and and then he wrote this one pilot 
And people wrote it and went, read it and went, okay, we're going right to series. Right. It's like, what? Right. And all of a sudden they're making a TV show. And I, I love the cast. And it was, you know, not, not unknown to me that I was one of the biggest people barracking for Michael Malarkey from uh, Vampire Diaries, which is another show that I love. And so I was, I was very much, I could have done Vampire Diaries today. I mean, that show, I watched every episode of that show, start to finish. And then when my daughter was old enough, I think she was then 16, we watched it together. Mm. Oh, oh. So great. And, and once, by the way, ran into Ian Summerholder on the street. Oh. He was so nice to her, so <laughs> sweet to her. And the only thing he wouldn't do is he wouldn't take a picture on the cell phone. And But what he said to her was, live outside your phone, right? Mm. The phone mm. is not important, right? Just see every, you know, he was amazing. I was I was really touched by that. But yeah, that's another show that that actually in a weird way meant a lot to me. I think that the, the showrunner, and now her name is escaping me, which is bad. Uh, but Julie Pless or uh, Julie? Julie Pleck. Yeah, Julie Pleck, because I think, and I'm just in season two now of the show. Imagine she did what seven or eight seasons, but and and this is partly Buffy also is that there's a kind of math to putting character relationships together. You could almost chart it out on a board, and one of the hardest things to chart over a long period of time is a love story because mm -hmm. it's it's going to be difficult and it, what happens and how do you make that work? And on Vampire Diaries, she was brilliant. I mean, brilliant. And, and that's always a show that I cite when I think about that, because and, and, and listen, Whedon, too, when you think about it. And when you look at Buffy's or any one of the characters, right? I mean, Xander and Cordelia and Xander and Anya. I mean, he was very much attuned to making these character relationships logical, like this is how this would happen. Mm -hmm. um, and also magical, I think, you know, and also Oz and Willow and then Willow and Tara. Right. I mean, that whole thing is it's pretty amazing. I mean, that's another thing that he did. Um, that I'm sure, by the way, inspired Julie Pleck among the people, right? I mean, I can't imagine it didn't, you know? It's fascinating to see how much Buffy and Twin Peaks have influenced the shows that came afterwards, uh, how how much um, the writing, the filmmaking, the acting, the, the way the themes were treated in these uh, TV series uh, really changed uh, television uh, up to now, and it continues to be the case, isn't it? I, I think it did, and, and I think Twin Peaks is rightly, I mean, I have, I've said it more than once, that for me, Twin Peaks is probably one of the most important shows in the history of the medium, mm. right? And there's a handful of others that I would cite, Twilight Zone is one of them, for example. Mm. But I mean, I just, I feel like that was some, I don't think Buffy gets the credit that it should in that same regard. Right. Mm -hmm. Because people tend to go, oh, Twin Peaks, oh, let's skip on to Lost and then we'll do The Sopranos. I, I th for whatever reason, I think and maybe it's the mistake I was making originally was, well, it's just a high school show. Mm -hmm. But I, I think that it's and, and genre shows aren't you know always on those lists. But I, but I think Buffy really deserves a place in that conversation, because, as you say, I mean, very much like with Peaks. It's just, it inspired so many people. And I know just personally how much it inspired me. And I'll tell you, when I'm in those writer's rooms, same thing. All these young writers, even ones I'm working with now who are like in their late 20s or, you know, even younger, completely attuned to what that meant and what it was about and the lessons that they learned from it, which I think are invaluable. Mm -hmm. and, and let me tell you, my... My character in Reginald the Vampire at the end of at one point in season one, his entire life has fallen apart and he gets on a bus and he rides out of town. And I couldn't af afford a Sarah McLaughlin song to play over it. But <laughs> nonetheless, there are there are definite, definite nods uh, to Buffy in the show that we're doing now, just because it's uh, well, I couldn't escape it if I wanted to. But I think it's probably an escape for a lot of people. And, and particularly if you were doing, you know, because all the characters in my show now are probably in, in their 20s, in the 20s, they're young. So those problems, those things you deal with, you want to kind of take those tropes uh, into the world of narrative. And I feel like, correct me if I'm wrong, but prior to Buffy, I feel like the vampire trope on television wasn't really an important presence. And ever since we've had a steady slew with True Blood, with the Vampire Diary, yeah. and on all of its spinoffs, um, and the show that you're currently working on right now. Yeah, no, it's it's crazy. I mean, and you're absolutely right. I think prior prior to Buffy, and look, do credit to the writers who created the Buffy the Vampire character, as Rand Kirshner, I think. And I mean, those people who were there at the very beginning who did that movie, right? That shouldn't be forgotten. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, at that point, I think vampires, there were, you know, there was Blackulus and Blaxploitation vampire stuff, and there was Dark Shadows. Mm -hmm. um, and 
which a friend of mine was in the reboot. So I, you know, it was sort of on the periphery, but now it's, I mean, when our show came out last season, I remember it's, I shouldn't, I should never read reviews, but I sometimes do. And so there was, but there was a review in the New York times where the whole point was, well, you got to pick one of these vampire shows, right? Or it's LA times because there were like three that just came out last year. So mm-hmm. it's, you know, that's, yeah, it's interesting how I think in a way sturdy that is. And I think it because it gives writers things to work with and worlds to explore and it, and it continues to work like that. It's, it's, I mean, zombies are sort of like it, but I think only if you find ways to make them more interesting than just staggering mm-hmm. beats. But then you look at The Last of Us and it worked very well for them. I think they learned lessons from other shows that have been on. And mm-hmm. so I, yeah, that genre kind of, those kinds of stories. It's funny, werewolves, although now I guess Sarah Michelle Gellar is bringing those back. Mm-hmm. That's the one that was sort of ignored. Yeah, that's right. And I just remembered that you also worked on Dracula around 2013, yeah, if I'm not mistaken. I did. And that was another one of those stories where Cole Haddon was a young writer, wrote a pilot, David Greenblatt read it at NBC and said, yeah, let's make the show. So again, went right to series. It was a very complicated production. Um, it was in Hungary. And I mean, the stories are, in fact, Cole has written like a huge, um, is it Substack? Is that what it's called? He's, he's written a huge thesis about the show and what happened and what went wrong, and you know, which is fairly interesting. But yeah, even then dealing with those tropes was really fun. And his concept that, you know, that Dracula was in fact, you know, basically Steve Jobs in Victorian England was actually a pretty pretty funny idea. And yes, you're right. That in fact was the first writer's room I did when I decided I didn't want to do movies anymore. I want to try to focus on television. And that was the first one. So Mm -hmm. yeah, I I had some vampire DNA in my past and, and trust me, I tried hard to get on vampire diaries. It was just just seemingly impossible um, or the originals for that matter. But it, yeah, to me, it's like, and again, the originals is so, all those shows, they all have their ways of inspiring you. And in fact, I just wrote something that, that to me, I, I recalled how the originals ended. And, and so I just, I, you know, I think that for all those television shows, it's funny, they all do live in a world, right? It'd be funny if there was a, you know, a way to like say just it's, it's all happening simultaneously, right? Don't, you know, break down the walls between them ontologically and just let it be. And, and I, and for me, that's, that's sort of the joy of it, right? Mm-hmm. That when I'm watching Vampire Diaries, it doesn't mean that Buffy doesn't exist. It means Buffy might be a couple towns over, right? And so for me, it's, that's been one of the pleasures of watching it. And I've always loved that, I mean, it's like my reading now. It's really pretty much all genre, right? Mm-hmm. It's whether it's hard science fiction or comical space operas or whatever. You know, that to me is what I find most interesting, mm-hmm. right? It's just because of the impossibility of it, I guess. And that also, I think it makes you feel young again in a lot of ways when you're reading that stuff or when you're watching it, mm-hmm. right? Because I'll tell you, you can be my age and watch Buffy and go, ah, oh, that's what high school felt like. <laughs> right? That's one of the things about the show that I, one of the many things that I love about it. Mm. Could you tell us um, um, something about the shows on which you're currently working uh, about? If you're able if, to share if, anything. Yes. <laughs> no, sure. I mean, the first season was out. In fact, I, I remember sending one of the cast members the French dubbed version because I want them to see what it sounded like in French. Yeah. Um, it's based on a series of books and it's and the books are really very smart. There's like seven of them and the books are called Fat Vampire. Um, Universal did not want to call a show Fat Vampire, which I, a battle I fought and lost. Um, but the, but the idea behind the books, which is sort of, which is very interesting, which is that vampires had become sort of beautiful, perfect cheekboned, vapid monsters, right? And they had basically self-selected to such an extent that they were, it was like the Met Gala come to life with stupid people, right? And that's who vampires were. And this young oversized it's jacob Badlon in our show who's the sidekick in all the spider-man movies um suddenly becomes a vampire and he's an outlier and he's and everything he stands for they find not right right and so it's really about his path and it's it, you know the metaphors are all over the place but it's a little bit about having to die and become a monster before you can be a better man and how he navigates this world and how he eventually wants to be a force to try to change what vampires can be right and there's and that goes back to like I mean, oddly enough, like trans rights or all those things, it's all about honoring difference 
and honoring differences and then fighting for those things. And, and so that's part of his journey. But I, I describe it often as a rom-com, office comedy, a workplace comedy, melodrama. In other words, it has all of those things crammed into it. It leans more toward the, the, the comedic, I think. Um, but I've had so much fun doing it. It's been really great. And doing a second season where we're taking even bigger swings has been a pleasure, you know, because not a lot of shows get to that second season these days. And so once again, I'm in that world and writing stories about vampires and in this case, angels, which has been fun. Um, which, you know, Supernatural, another show I watched start to finish, right? Mm -hmm. Did I mean, it's funny when I start thinking about those shows, it's easy to forget them, but they're a, they were a big part of my last 20 years is watching all of that television. Mm -hmm. And what about Chucky? Chucky is still ongoing, yes? Uh, yes, Chucky, I, it's funny, I worked on a show called Channel Zero that Nick Antosca did which is a wonderful television show. I mean, just- Well, Ronk wanted to tell you that we could, our cat's <laughs> name is Percy. So he's often oh. called Pirate Percy. <laughs> there you go. It's, I absolutely love that show. Loved working on it. Um, I was brought, it was one of those last minute things where Nick Antosca had just been, a, he worked on various shows, but he'd never run a show. And they said, "Can will you come in and, and be his sort of guide, right? Now, the funny thing is I, I said, great, I'm, I'm, it'll be fun. But I, the, I think the first day I got there, I realized that A, he'd been in more writer's rooms than I had been, right? And B, he did not need any guidance, right? But the point was, is that we had a great collaborative atmosphere there and wonderful writers. We had so much fun doing it. And in the second season, Don Mancini joined the writer's room. And of course, Don created Chucky and has devoted a great deal of his creative life to it. And so when he then, when Channel Zero ended and he got Chucky up on its feet, I was in that writer's room for the first season. Um, and that was so much fun. I mean, talk about a crazy world to inhabit, right? And dealing with all the various tropes and all the wonderful stuff that he, that Don has done over the years about queer stories and different kind of transgender stories, all that stuff is really, I mean, I mean, it's not just, I mean, of course it's bold. It shouldn't have to be bold, but I mean, I think that what he's done is really tremendous. It's funny. I wasn't able to do the second season because I was doing this show, but my stepdaughter, um, who's a crazy, insane, wonderful writer, was actually the writer's assistant on the season that I had done. And now she's in the writer's room on Chucky. So in fact, Don just texted me because everyone's racing the strike and are you getting your scripts done? He's in, he's in Toronto and I'm on the other side of Canada. So mm -hmm. we're both getting, I'm actually, I think he's starting to shoot actually maybe next week. But yeah, I love Chucky. That was a really fun show to do. Um, mm -hmm and a lot of good people i mean that's the nice thing i think about doing television i mean i spent so many years as a feature development writer and it was great i'd get up make a cup of coffee and walk to my office and go to work and it was an easy but solitary life and you know and that's the wonderful thing about television is that is yes the collaboration also it's just you get to be with all these great crazy fun creative people all the time you know and that's what it was like on twin peaks even though we didn't have a writer's room per se but just being able to go to work every day and spend time with mark and, and work on these various ideas and see how that world was expanding i mean it was just so much fun and and i've been lucky i've been in rooms that aren't fun and that's always a drag but it's but for the most part i've been on shows and of course when i've run my own show um where that it's it's a real safe space and it's just a great place for creative people to have insane conversations and frequently talk about Buffy. <laughs> yeah, this is one of the questions that we wanted to ask you. It's not directly about Buffy, but about the work uh, of a writer um, who's writing for television or for cinema. Um, can, can you tell us a little bit about that, about the difference perhaps that there is when you write for a film and when you write for a TV series? And, and perhaps yeah. also... I mean, writers to me are sort of forgotten, uh, the, the, the forgotten profession compared to directors or to actors. And whereas, I mean, you create the story that is going to be on the screen. So uh, that's something paradoxical, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, it's funny when I, and I've done this for a very long time. And so when I started and, and the world was completely different then in terms of how hard it was to get work or what kind of job you would do. But I had written a script just on my own for myself that was based on hanging out in clubs in Los Angeles, right? I used to hang out in all these punk clubs. And so that script kind of made the rounds and people really liked it. So my third script, the third script I ever wrote was Lesson Zero. And so suddenly I'm writing movies. And and it's 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 a solitary experience. It, at that time, it can be, oppressive is not the right word, but there's the, over time, so many voices started coming in, voices from the studio, voices, from, you know, and, and of course the director, it's really the director's playground. 
So I I worked in that world forever and was kind of happily forgotten. Right? I mean, I didn't it didn't bother me. I was like enjoying myself. I love being able to write and and have and I was very lucky, right? Uh, financially, all of it. It was it could have been nicer. But when I started doing television, I realized that it was a much more. The thing was is that at particularly at the time when you talk to different writers, movies were about the were about the deal. Right. They were about trying to put all these pieces together. They usually didn't get made. You'd write your you'd write your feature script. Away it goes. Nothing. It's over. Right. That's what that was. TV is about making the show in a much more specific way that it was much more about in a funny way. It's a weird word to use, but it was almost a more adult process. And I remember doing TV when I did in the early years in the 90s. And it was after Twin Peaks. And I would, you know, you go to a network and you sell them an idea and then you make the show. And sure, there are pilots that don't get made. I mean, don't get me wrong. But nonetheless, the process just seemed more adult. And particularly then there were fewer voices. So you really had the opportunity to work with just a couple executives. And if you were lucky and they were good, they were collaborators who were really helping you. And that was really important. And then, of course, we had the kind of explosion of television where it was like, finally, the writers are in charge. Oh, and look how it looks, right? And now suddenly you have The Sopranos and you have Breaking Bad and you have all these shows. A lot of shows being written by people who had gone through that process in the 90s, right? And yet they were now suddenly in a different position. But one thing I noticed when that happened is what I call the movification of the television business, which was that all of a sudden more people would give you notes. All of a sudden, and you never heard this early on, but it was like, well, can we get a big name director for this pilot? It was like, What? This is television, right? You know, it's like, get me Leslie Link Gladder who can do an amazing job, right? And that's really what I need. I don't need a feature director to come in who doesn't know how to shoot TV, right? So it's interesting that it's the difference between the two is very stark, but over time it's gotten a little less so. But now it's, to be perfectly frank, it's just insane. I mean, it's just crazy now because you have all these streamers and they're making a different cut and the streamers are in the press release business. So they really want to be able to do a press release that's saying, hey, look, here's who's writing our show or here's who's directing our show or who's who's acting in it. So now I'll see that and then subscribe to their stream, right? That's what they do. Mm -hmm. and, and that's hard because they're not going to say, hey, we have a Harley Payton show. Lucky you, right? It's just not going to happen, right? And But the nice thing is that there are places like the Sci-Fi Channel where they still care first and foremost about the story. Mm -hmm. They're not in the press release business. They're in the TV making business. And I've had such a great experience at sci-fi. By the way, Channel Zero, Chucky, you know, all these shows, right? Dominion, all these different shows that I worked with that were sci-fi shows. And now my, my show, Reginald, it's been such a pleasure to work with people who love television, who in this case at, at, at sci-fi love Buffy. But and also it just it, it's it, it's really nice to be in a place where the story is what's important. <clears throat> if they don't. They never said, well, can we get a director? Mm -hmm. And by the way, they never said, we were very lucky with Jacob Badalon, but they never said, can we get you know an actor even? It was like, we're here for the story. Tell, tell us a story that we haven't heard, and then you're off. And to me, that was wonderful. Great yeah. opportunity. And continuing with this theme of film script writing versus television, Am I correct in thinking that television writing might be a bit more collaborative? You know, we always hear about film scripts, how someone will write one and then someone will come in and, and rewrite it. And it seems yeah. like this stream of people who work on the same script. Is television a lot more collaborative in terms of being in a writer's room? It is by definition. And, and in fact, I remember there was a, a thread about the strike where a, a woman was complaining about the guild trying to mandate that there had to be writers rooms on shows because she felt like, what do I need a writer's room for? And that's just so wrong. <clears throat> when I think about some of my favorite moments in my show this year, um, you know, one of the, one of some of the best things were written by other writers, right? Okay. The thing that is important is that in the writer's room, <clears throat> there'll be moments that I would never have thought of. Mm -hmm. It's a joke or a move or an idea or, and so for me, the writer's room is really a sacred space. And yes, it's my job to come in on every script and do that production pass. And I'll change things because I want to. And that's the pleasure of having my job. Mm -hmm. But not, but you have to, but understanding the value of a writer's room and mm -hmm. how collaborative it is. And also for me, an old white guy, it's really great to have a writer's room even that's diverse in terms of age and, mm -hmm. you know, and gender preferences and race. All the, the room that we put together is really a wonderful place. And I've learned a lot from the writers who are in there. And mm -hmm. most of them half my age. So there's that. 
it's very interesting because it goes against somehow what we are taught, at least in France, mm. about creation, which is something yeah. by one person, uh, and you are almost gifted. Uh, you you have the gift, and this is not something you can learn, and, and you receive uh, uh, the ideas, and you put them on paper, whereas here it seems very much more about an exchange pro uh, process yeah. and about um, playing really ping pong uh, with ideas, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, I, look, I think one of the first film books I read was probably Saris's book on the auteur theory. So I'm well versed in how that worked and believe in it, right? I mean, like a Howard Hawks movie to me is a Howard Hawks movie. But, and those are things that I absolutely love. But, but the great thing about television, it was pretty much always different, right? Even if you're talking about shows like, <clears throat> it was the one that Mark worked on, Hill Street Blues, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, shows like that, all those different writers are are contributing, right? And even someone like Damon Lindelof, who I think is probably one of the best writers currently working in TV, takes full advantage of what other writers can do. In fact, he has a new show, which I'm dying to see, called Mrs. Davis, which is apparently insane. And, and he co-wrote it with a woman who wrote Young Sheldon and How I Met Your Mother. So yeah. imagine those two sensibilities colliding. But that's the wonder of television, I think, is that it's a place where that happens. Mm -hmm. And the writer's room in particular, when you think about all those different shows, you know, Mad Men or, you know, The Sopranos or whatever, those writer's rooms are really important. It, and it, listen, it's a great way to make a living. It's so much fun. But also, I think it's what makes television different. And I think by de definition, more collaborative. And that doesn't mean that there can't be very distinct directorial voices. I mean, God knows Twin Peaks is a good example of that. Mm -hmm. You know, when you're creating those worlds, that, that obviously still happens. Mm -hmm. But I think the way the stories are told is sort of different. And, and I, I think that's a really valuable thing. And that's why I always love listing all of those, you know, Doug Petrie, all those writers on Buffy, because you get to know them after a while. And I remember even at the time going, oh, good, it's an Espenson episode. This mm -hmm. is going to be funny because she was they all had various strengths and that's something that to me is a really important part of that process yeah fantastic i always like to ask um people who come on our, our podcast is there something you wished we would have asked <laughs> is there a question that you would have liked to have <laughs> I don't, I thought you were going to say something, it was more like something I wished I'd worked on, which I could tell you. I don't, well, that could be the question. I mean, if the question to Joss Whedon was, what are the writer's rooms you wish you'd been in? Mm -hmm. You know, I think for me, I think for me, it would probably be, it would, well, it would be Buffy, mm -hmm. uh, first and foremost, and then probably Lost. I'm just fascinated by that show and that process. Um, I did, those are two of the shows that in particular, and and no surprise, it's genre television and genre narrative that I'm most interested in. In other words, I, you know, have great respect and, and even affection for shows like, like The Sopranos, but <clears throat> I can't imagine myself in that writer's room, but I sure could have imagined myself in Vampire Diaries, Julie Pleck. <laughs> <laughs> it's a pity I never had the opportunity. Well, I know, but especially that show owes so much to doppelgangers, that <laughs> with your Twin Peaks credentials. Exactly. <laughs> You would think. Um, <laughs> anyway, yeah, so those are the kind of things that, and look, I, I when I look at what I've worked on in the last years and, you know, Channel Zero and Chucky and everything, I've been really lucky. I mean, that's that's the thing I'm always amazed about because I think for a, a young writer now, it's, it's a very different world. And at times, I think probably a more difficult one. You know, I think there's just so many different um, business forces. I mean, it's no, you know, huge corporations all own the people who show us television. And it didn't used to be that way, right? When I was coming up, it were there were families and there were different people who were running these places. And you know, now they have a whole different. I mean, when I think of poor Warner Brothers now suddenly being Max, I mean, it's just, you know, that's that's sort of sad. But setting that nostalgic aspect aside, you know, I think for young writers now, and I talk to them a lot, including my stepdaughter, who is one, is it just what how do we get to where we want to go? And it's just a much different world now. Mm -hmm. And it's and and watching them navigate that has been something. But but again, that's why to me writers' rooms are so important. Yeah. And when I hear a showrunner say I don't need it, first of all, I think that's just a creative mistake. 
But mm -hmm. also I think there's a pay it forward aspect where it's like, no, 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 you should have a writer's room so these people can learn their craft because one of these days they're going to run a writer's room, right? And the hope is that they do the same. So that's certainly what I've done. And in fact, I have a writer in my current room who, you know, I, he's now in sort of showrunner training. So every one of my Zooms and production meetings, he's there. So he's learning how it's done, you know? And it's, mm -hmm. and that's something that I learned by watching Mark but it was, you know, and so I had a great training there, both in what works and what can be insane and not work. So that was really, for me, a really pro a kind of proving ground. And, and so it's been really helpful ever since to kind of do that. And, and I hope that's as we now approach the possibility of another strike. Um, you know, I hope people still have those opportunities, you know, because it's um, the world can sometimes be upside down. Yeah. yeah. Not to end on a sad note at all, because this is all <laughs> fuffy. <laughs> yeah, yeah. someone that joke. I mean, <laughs> I'm telling you though, when Buffy ended, I really wanted to be on that school bus. I just wanted <laughs> I'll go, let me get on that bus and I'll go see what happens next. And as we said, and for those people who don't know, the comic books are a great way to find out what happened next. Mm -hmm. You know, and as I said, in Angel, they literally did season five, right? It's mm -hmm. like, yeah, this is what happened after the apocalypse. I mean, it's quite amazing to me. And and as you, and I'm now going to look up these X Files ones for the same reason, because for me that's it's it's nice to be able to continue something that because you know listen a t show that you love goes away that's a loss, mm -hmm. um, and it live forever and particularly now you have you know access to all these things and mm -hmm. I can watch the prom later today if I want to have a good cry, but mm -hmm. the fact of the matter is is that it's you know it's it's important they're they become important parts of our lives I think. Mm -hmm. And being able to write in that world, of course, is just a pleasure. I feel like I'm the luckiest guy in the world. So mm -hmm. there's that. <laughs> thank you so much. Thank you. And perhaps oh, thank you. To, to end this podcast on a note that connects Buffy and, and Twin Peaks and time paradoxes, because you were talking about the possibility to go back and watch those uh, those episodes. Uh, in one episode of Buffy, where she's facing some paradoxes uh, in the time structures, she says that the time has become all David Lynch. So... <laughs> 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 no, I remember that line. Yes, they did reference Lynch, I think. Yes, and as well they should have, right? Although you know me, if you've re if you've read the things that I interviews I've done, it's Lynch Frost. Um, because I will always be Mark's, I mean, he's a very good friend of mine to this day, but I mean, I will always be his biggest supporter because I know what he contributed and I know how important that was and what an amazing marriage that was. But that's that's a subject for another podcast. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> But one we certainly share and agree with you on. Um, it's really important to cite both of them. And also to really um, let people know that Mark Frost has written some wonderful novels as well that we really appreciate. Wonderful novels and currently has a play in rehearsal that oh. I, I can't talk about, I don't think. But I saw it up on, I saw it up on its feet in New York if, when I, actually during the last Comic-Con. Um, it's going to be quite special. Mm -hmm. It's He's got a great director he's working with. Uh, it's... It's a it's a period piece. I'll say that's all I'm going to say. But it, but all the point is, nonetheless, he's working on a play, and I think it's going to be amazing. Right. And wonderful. You know, I don't think I'm giving away anything by saying that much. It, it just <laughs> teases us enough that yes. we'll look out for it, yes. so we know yeah, exactly. No, I I would think, in fact, that they'll. I mean, yeah, I would think in the next year, I wouldn't be surprised if they were taking it to the next step. Um, but yes, he's well. He's such a wonderful writer. And, and we've talked about trying to do something else. And we, you know, it's, and we, there was a French resistance idea he had, which oh, I would love to have done. Um, so he, you know, you never know. But Mark is, you know, he's very happy with his life and the novels are very good. He's such a good writer. Yeah. So yeah, that was, he was instrumental certainly in my life and, and is one of the main reasons that I'm even sitting here. Wonderful. Thank you, Mr. Payton for having taken the time to be with us. Uh, tonight for us, uh, the, this yes. morning for you. <laughs> yes. Midday mid for me. Have a, have a great day. Yes, you too. And we look forward to seeing your next project. Oh, thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you for listening to After Images. Please subscribe on your favorite podcast app and follow After Images podcast on social media.